Ian Thompson is here with a roundup from all the news from Google I.O. Two senators want to end mass hacking. And we talked to a photographer who got some amazing shots of the SpaceX Falcon 9 landing. We'll talk about all that and so much more on Tech News Today, coming up. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1518, recorded Friday, May 20th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. Oh, hi, this is Tech News Today, the show where we talk about self-driving cars and drones and Microsoft and Google and Apple and all the tech news with people who love technology. I am Megan Maroney. Jason Howell is still in Mountain View or headed back from Mountain View. Hopefully he's not still in Mountain View waiting for someone to give him a free Google Home or a pair of Google's Daydream VR goggles. Uh, Ian Thompson is here joining me today from the register. Welcome, Ian. Hi, Megan. Always a pleasure. <sighs> so were you bummed they didn't give anything away at Google I.O.? Uh, well, actually, it's part of a, it, it seems to be part of a trend because Microsoft didn't give anything away at the, their Build Developers Conference either. Um, the rumor is that we're going to be getting an email in a couple of months saying there's, there will be a home delivered to your office uh, or, or you know, your place of residence at some point. I think possibly they're going to spam out the home devices. Um, but actually, talking to developers, they weren't that bothered about not getting the free kit. Um, they're more bothered about not being able to get into the sessions in the sessions themselves because of overcrowding. But uh, yeah, I mean, the free kit was always nice, but it's not the be-all and end-all of the thing at the end of the day. Right. Well, there's uh, so much to talk about. I know you were there for two days. Uh, you can uh, talk about the news and also maybe rant a little bit. Uh, so let's <laughs> get started. Uh, Google's Project Aura is back in the news today. Google's Advanced Technology and Products Division, also known as ATAP, also known as the group that does weird things that sometimes we see eventually. They've been teasing us with this modular phone for at least two years now, if not more. Today, the company says a consumer model of the phone will be available in 2017. Uh, what are your thoughts, Ian, on this, what I like to call the Lego phone? Yes. Well, I guess if you tread on it in the middle of the night, it's about as painful as well. No, I mean, I'm I'm really, really positive about about Ara. If it actually works, it'll be great because it'll deal with one of the central problems, which is having to throw phones away at the end of the day or just have them cluttering up the back cupboard. The idea of modular of modular electronic devices hasn't really taken off, though, in the past. If you remember with Palm, they had the Handspring uh, mm -hmm. a, a offshoot company, which would customize a Palm Pilot with various little sleeves that you could slip onto it, giving you GPS or phone coverage or something like that. Ara is, I mean, as you say, it's been a long time coming. If it works, I think it'll be great. But it's a question of if it works. I mean, these kind of things are very difficult to engineer. You've got to make sure the connectors in particular don't break off. And uh, you've got to have support from other manufacturers who are going to build the modules to go into it. It's a marvelous idea. I really hope it works. But uh, I'm going to remain skeptical until I've actually got my paws on one. <laughs> so the modules are like, let's say, I, I really need a camera and I really need... Um, a microphone or something, you know, so that that's how you switch out the modules. But what you're saying is it's also made so that our phones aren't so disposable, that that's how we'll upgrade? Well, yeah. I mean, one of the one of the ideas behind it is that, for example, if you want to update your processor, you might be able to do that. Google hasn't said exactly on that front. But I mean, it's basically, you know, if you, need, if you want GPS, but you don't want it all the time, you could plug in a GPS module. If you want a better camera, because you know you're going to be doing something which needs better shots, you could plug in a new camera module. The idea itself is really good, but it's all about the execution. Doing this kind of hardware is incredibly difficult to do reliably. And I get the feeling that unless they've, Google spent an awful lot of time trying to make sure that they've got this properly designed so that you don't end up with modules that you plug in and they don't work. Mm -hmm. Well, they said developers will get the kits later this year. Uh, there was also some, in, apparently they can eject with your voice too. You would just say like, okay, Google, eject the module. 
That sounds interesting. That would be interesting. I mean, it, it, it fits in. They're doing an awful... They're basically, Google they're, for this week has been all about voice control. Um, so if you can do that with a phone, then all well and good. But they've been doing, spent so much money over the last few years on natural language processing and getting machine learning involved with that as well, that they're really trying to, you know, sort of push the, the idea of voice search rather than text search. Some interesting data from the show, they were saying that 20% of mobile searches are done by voice. And as a big user of voice search myself, I can, I can quite believe that. And it is a big hook in for their products. When I was back home last time, my father-in-law um, saw me doing this and he just thought it was like something out of Star Trek and immediately downloaded it and got it installed on his own phone so he could do it as well. I don't know, voice search works very well in a lot of areas. It's not great if you're looking for, say, specific company names or specific person's names. But now I don't even bother typing in, you know, my voicemail code. I just say, call voicemail, and the phone does it. Yeah, and you have to imagine that if uh, these Google Home voice-activated devices uh, really take off, which I believe they will, um, Google's just going to get smarter and smarter about all things. I mean, just have so much more data, so much more voice data for them. Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, the I, I agree with you. I think Home is going to be very big. I think they might run into slight privacy concerns in other parts of the world. But certainly, as we've seen with Amazon's Echo, there is a definite demand for this kind of product. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the whole the whole push towards voice, I, I think, will fit in with that. Google, of course, also announced the Assistant, which will be listening into what you're saying and, and sort of tailoring things to you that way. Um, so it's Home will really help with that. And ho the Assistant is going to be embedded in the Home product right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Well, what I guess Google is counting on being even easier than controlling things with your voice is controlling things with hand gestures in the air. So a wave or a snap of your fingers. Uh, the future of that is not here quite yet, but Google did unveil a partnership with LG that showed a demo of how you might be able to control the LG Urbane smartwatch with your hand. Uh, this was Project Solely. We saw a little bit of this last year, uh, also at I.O., uh, but now they, it's, I guess it's a radar system. Did you see this in action at all, Ian? I, I couldn't actually get to get in to see it in action, but I did do a lot of reading uh, reading around it. On the on the face of it, it looks rather good because it does get rid of one of the central problems of smartwatches, which is the user interface and mm -hmm. being able to actually man manipulate data on there. They've also just upgraded Android Wear so you can write on the screen of the, of the smartwatch as well. But this mini radar system, I think, is very, very interesting. And gesture control is something that the industry is pushing towards. However, I'm slightly skeptical because I do worry what it's going to do to battery life. With smartwatches, you've already got to recharge the battery every single night if you want to be assured of a full day's use the next day. If you're throwing radar in there, unless they've got some very, power, some very important power-saving stuff in there, I think we're going to see a real problem with batteries. Now, gesture control is all well and good, but it's the the it's kind of the leap of user interface, if you like, is going to be very difficult for some people to do. And I think if it doesn't work well the first couple of times, a lot of people are going to abandon it. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because um, I just read a piece in Recode by Mark Bergen about just talking about how if you talk to any Google employee at Google I.O., they use the phrase early days. Like that was the big thing that everyone was saying, oh, this is early days. And when you begin to hear these things year after year, you know, this exact gesture control uh, was talked about last year. And now it's like we're still working on it, but there's a power issue. Um, it becomes a little bit exhausting, but at the same time, maybe we're just jaded. Like the, the, maybe this really is early days that we we were so in touch with all this technology and hearing about it first that uh, you know it it's normal that it's going to take a long time i know it's it's tricky that they're, they're kind of between the devil and the deep blue sea on this one because you know on the one hand they want to talk about these things and on the other hand actually getting a finished product is actually quite tough now they do talk about they do talk these things up a little bit and then we have to wait years and years before they come which is why we at the red call them the chocolate factory after willy wonka <laughs> But, you know, it's it's one of those things where it will come if they can make it work. And what worries me when they start delaying these things for year after year is the only reason they're doing that, must surely, is that they can't make it work. And I think that's the problem we've seen with the RF phone, and I think that's the problem we're going to see with the radar, radar as well. Because that really has to work spot on if people are going to get accustomed to it and get using it. Mm-hmm.
Uh, so on the first day of Google I.O., on Wednesday, they announced Allo. That's the new chat app that knows if your mom has sent you a picture of a Bernese Mountain Dog and you can respond appropriately with a smart reply. It's very fun and exciting. The catch was that Google would not be turning on end-to-end -end encryption by default on this uh, chat app. Now a Google engineer says that while Allo's features of disappearing messaging, he thinks, are more important than end-to-end -end encryption, he said... He says or said he'll push for default end-to-end -end encryption in Allo. He was writing in his personal blog. Uh, it's Google engineer Tai Duong. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name somewhat right. He said uh, of end-to-end -end encryption, I wish it's the default because it's my feature, ha ha. But even if it's not the default, all is not lost. I can't promise anything now, but I'm pushing for a setting where users can opt out of clear text messaging. So uh, TechCrunch reported, uh, and also Edward Snowden also tweeted this, <laughs> that this and another few paragraphs have since been deleted from the engineer's blog. Uh, so what do you, <laughs> indeed, of course, you could have seen that coming from a mile away, right? Oh, no. I mean, I think he basically, the minute that the media picked up on this, he was getting phone calls from head office, just like, get that out now. <laughs> because, you know, it was, it's something that came up again and again after the LO presentation. It's just, why are you not doing end-to-end -end encryption on the entire thing? Why just in incognito mode? And we can't get our head around why. I couldn't get a straight answer out of everyone, it, out of anyone. It was just like, well, you know, it's difficult to employ, or we're not sure people want it, or the customer doesn't demand it, as is, is the you know is the phrase du jour for these sort of things. But end-to-end -end encryption, you would have thought, in wake of the Snowden revelations, is a no-brainer. I don't understand why they put it in there, and I can't get a straight answer on why not. I mean, it's they they have it in the incognito mode, and I looked. I, I remember I was discussing this with a fellow journalist at the actual presentation when they unveiled the incognito mode and explained about the encryption side of it. It was just like, well, on Chrome, incognito mode is for porn. This incognito mode is for affairs. Uh, that may just be the way our mind works, but you know, it's it's. But it, it just it. I can't understand why they didn't just do end-to-end -end encryption on the whole thing. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. So, so it is not turned on. It does exist. It's not turned on by default. So, I mean, we've been hearing about all these other chat apps that that's their selling point and end encryption. And are those all turned on by default? A lot of them are. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for for a really good encrypted IM service, then there are plenty out there which offer decent end to end encryption. Hopefully, you know, obviously we haven't examined their encryption algorithms in depth, but they all look pretty solid. Um, and it's something that people really want as well, I think. Now, they have got some things. They've got messages which, you know, can delete themselves after a time. You know, there, are, there is some security stuff in there. But what this really needs is default end-to-end -end encryption all the way along the line. U.S. government might not like it, but I know their customers will. And, I mean, do you think that that's why? I mean, do you think that they, I mean, they, they do work with the government? Do you think that's why they uh, did not turn it on by default? Um, hmm. Based on my read from Google execs, I don't think that's why they did it. Um, Google, yes, does work with the U.S. government. It's got its, you know, sort of its cloud, cloud for government services. And obviously, a good relationship with the government is very important. But at the same time, Google has shown that it has backbone in these things. And they are not prepared to just roll over and do whatever the U.S. government says is best. And for a single messaging app, I don't think the government would have put too much pressure on them. It may be that they're deciding to do it, you know, as a sort of... Um, what's the best way to describe it, as sort of a peace offering to the government. But it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. And enough people are riled about this now that I'm expecting we're going to see end-to-end -end encryption rolled out on a low before it launches. And this is probably something I should know, but services like Snapchat, they're not, uh, they don't have end-to-end -end encryption, do they? Snapchat, I don't think does. I mean, there are a number of sort of uh, Moxie Modern Spike has done uh, a, lot of, a lot of good work on this in terms of getting uh, decent end-to-end -end encryption in, into, uh, into messaging apps. But it's not mainstream as yet. It really should be, but it isn't. Um, of course, there are members of the FBI who would say, I'm a, you know, wishing for end-to-end -end encryption is basically just aiding terrorists and, and child molesters. But, you know, in the real world, we would actually, and particularly in the commercial world, End-to-end -end encryption should be the standard you're aiming for if you're looking to protect your data. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, but if they're just looking to get as many users as, say, Snapchat has, then, you know, maybe it's, I, I think the Google engineer had a point also. He was saying, you know, we tend to focus on end-to-end -end encryption, but disappearing messages are more important. Would you agree with that? 
Um, yes, certainly in light of UK of uh, US law as well. I mean, I, I think we'll be we may be discussing the Rule Forty One situation later, mm-hmm. but you know, having messages which disappear and are, are wiped completely is quite important uh, if you're if you're at all concerned about privacy. I do think though, end-to-end encryption does need to be added into this because enough people are asking for it, and enough developers also wanted it. When you talk to the developers about it, they were you know rubbing their heads as well, trying to work out why on earth this wasn't included. Um, I can see his point. Uh, I think he's also getting a bollocking from his bosses at the moment, <laughs> talking about this in public. But, you know, I can see his point about it. But I think if there, if there's enough public support for it, because the app isn't out yet, it's out, out in the summer, that they will be turning that on by default. So that's certainly the read I'm getting so far. Yeah, I mean, that was the other thing that someone speculated, that it wasn't that he was giving away... Uh, that he was just saying something they didn't want him to say. It was he was giving away features that were going to be in a future product, and that was what they had a problem with. But who knows? Mm, yeah, it's it's likely. <laughs> uh, so our last Google I O story is a quick one. Uh, a new app called Science Journal lets you measure your environment, graph all your data, record your experiments, and organize all your questions and ideas. It sounded really interesting to me. It's not available on iOS. Uh, what do you think about this? App. I rather like it. I mean, it appeals to me too as a journalist. I think it's uh, it could be quite handy. And it obviously appeals to Google in a very big way because it allows them to collect all this useful data and use it and, you know, and use it in the way that they do. Um, I like it. I don't think it's going to be a big part of their business. Um, and I think it is going to worry some people about the amount of data that's involved and, and what it's being used for. Um, on the other hand, I think it could be very handy. I mean, if you if you've ever had a house guest who snored so loudly it woke everyone else up, this would be fantastic for it. <laughs> and so, um, maybe that's just I'm a little bit bitter about our last house guest, but still, no matter. You know? <laughs> but yeah, on the whole, really good. It's the kind of thing that Google engineers would have thought up with themselves, maybe on a 20% project, and then rolled it out, and it's such a good idea, they decided to use it. Yeah, it is one of those things that I think is a prime example of like, oh, wow, they're they're like actually collecting a lot of data for me, but it's so cute and looks so useful. I don't care. Yeah, I know. It's um interesting split, actually, that, that I owe this year between the European developers and the American developers, because the American developers love the idea of this. Uh, European developers are just like, that's a bit too much data to be collected on my personal device, which could be used in a number of ways. And it highlights the essential dichotomy between the US and Europe on this. US doesn't seem to give that much of a monkey's about privacy. Uh, what they care about is freedom of speech and cost. Whereas in the in Europe, privacy is absolutely central. And if you haven't got that sorted, then you're going to turn people off. And there is that, it's a very weird sort of oil and water situation. Uh, in the chat room, there appears to be a drinking game that started uh, every time you use the word privacy and pronounce it that way. So um, enjoy that I, or... <laughs> privacy? How am I supposed to... Oh, privacy. Oh, well, yeah. I know, I know. I've been over here too long, you see. I mean, privacy, the way I'd say it back back home in, 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 in on one level, but... Eight years in this country, and I'm starting to say gas instead of petrol, starting to say line instead of queue, asking where the restroom is. I mean, mind you, when I first came over, I asked where the loo was, and people just looked at me like I'd asked, them, asked, asked for something completely bizarre. Um, but yes, it's uh, unfortunately, it's, it's two great cultures split by a common language, as Winston Churchill put it. <laughs> Well, let's talk about another privacy story. Rule 41 is in the news again. Uh, we talked about this, I think, last time you were here. Uh, yesterday, a group of nonpartisan senators, including Ron Wyden and Ron Paul, introduced a response to the changes to Rule 41. It's called the Stop Mass Hacking Act. Is it as good as that sounds? It is really rather good, and you'd expect that given the two sponsors. I mean, Ron Wyden is is sort of the, the, the cowboy riding over the over the privacy um hill and uh, <laughs> don't change been, ian don't change ah uh, no i know he's been very good on this sort of thing and the minute the rule 41 rule change came up he was adamant that this was going to have to stop what's really encouraging is that he's got Rand paul on his side because that makes it a, bi- a bipartisan measure a lot easier to gain support and this sort of thing really does need legislation you can't let this go through on an administrative sort of a byword um it's a massively important issue and i think well, okay, I would love to see it, it go through, but I have to say we're in election year, everyone's very touchy, and two, both Wyden and, uh, Wyden and Paul aren't, let's say, the most popular senators within the Senate. They, they tend to care about things that a lot of other senators don't. 
So I'd like to see what kind of support they're getting. There is a, lot, a fair amount of support on the Democrat side, and some of the more libertarian-minded Republicans are coming on side as well. It all depends whether or not they can get this done before the rule change comes into, into effect. And speaking of pronunciation, I think I called him Ron Paul, Rand Paul. Sorry about that. Uh, if you're watching, Mr. Paul, <laughs> Senator Paul, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, after, old, go ahead. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just saying apparently it's an urban myth that he was named Rand after Ayn Rand. It was, it was short for Randall, but mm. it's, uh, yes, it's, uh, I mean, he, he's good on when it comes to privacy issues. Uh, Wyden is excellent in, in, in this area, but the libertarian side of the Republicans are very good on this as well. So I'd like to see how this develops. I do hope it works. Well, after the break, Minecraft is coming to China. Let's start building a great wall of blocks. But first, let's take a minute to thank Epson, the sponsor of this episode. Epson's revolutionary EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The new EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an innovative refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. The EcoTank ET4550 comes with enough ink to print up to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. That's equivalent to about 50 ink cartridge sets. You are loaded and ready to print for up to two years. It's powered by Epson's leading edge precision core technology, delivers high speed, vivid colors and laser quality black text, plus auto two-sided printing, a 30 page auto document feeder and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with ultra low cost replacement ink bottles. Now Epson recently released their creative print app. That makes it easier to preserve your Instagram and your Facebook photos. Download the app to create personalized photo collages, custom greeting cards, stationery, and coloring book templates. You can also print photos directly onto CDs and DVDs. Be creative on the go. Print from your mobile device to a variety of compatible Epson all-in-one printers within your wireless network. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home office or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the new Epson EcoTank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson for their support. So now is time for our weekly gaming segment with Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. Welcome, Sam. Hello, hello. It's good to see everybody. Good to see you. Right. How was your week? Uh, my week was interesting. I was in Santa Monica for events that I am not allowed to talk about. Uh, and I had to hide in hotel rooms where I couldn't be out on the beach. Uh, and then just now, I just got an HTC 10 in the mail, and I really look, see, it's it's already asking me for a pin. That's how you know it's legit. So I'm looking forward to playing with that as soon as I hang up with you guys. But first, video games, right? Yes. Uh, Minecraft is finally heading to China. Uh, what does that mean? Yes. Uh, my, Minecraft, uh, surprisingly, hasn't gotten a foothold uh, in China. Actually, interestingly, I'm looking uh, at the news today, there hadn't even been like a whole slew of clones like we've seen in the United States. The Minecraft genre, for whatever reason, the cl the building and making blocks and making a town kind of game hasn't really blown up there. Uh, but it looks like uh, Microsoft, uh, Mojang, the creators and developers of Minecraft, have inked a deal with a Chinese software distributor uh, that has already been uh, in the business of putting out Western games in China. Uh, this is a group of people who had put out World of Warcraft and Hearthstone. They're going to be putting out Overwatch, basically all of the big Blizzard hits. Uh, and that deal has been struck. Uh, the games will be coming to computers and smartphones at some point in the near future. Uh, that date hasn't been set yet. Uh, that news may not seem all that interesting to somebody in the in the West going, well, Minecraft, okay, I guess that's been around for a while and China's finally going to get their crack at it. Uh, but what it signifies here is this is sort of the what I think is the final piece of the uh, Minecraft acquisition. Uh, $2.5 billion, I believe, or give or take a few bazillion, uh, was spent to secure Minecraft. And Microsoft, I believe, was in a better position than anybody else to spend time and energy into navigating what it takes to release a game in China. Short version, it's a pain in the butt. Getting a Western game or any soft or really any product released in China, if you're not from China, requires a lot of permits, a lot of uh, higgledy-piggledy. Uh, and even then, if you don't have something that is local in China, you're still sort of screwed. So Microsoft had to find a partner that was already established and already set as a local, not foreign uh, company to make something like Minecraft sellable in China. So that's the first step is having a Chinese company come in. The second question is going to be, how will Minecraft look? 
in China. Now, China is a microtransaction sort of economy when it comes to software. You're not seeing people go to stores and buy boxed copies of things. And Minecraft is from the ground up built as kind of a premium experience in that you pay at least $7 for a mobile version, if not 10, 15, 20 for some of these other versions in order to get the entire experience unlocked no subscription fees. Uh, the, the one exception is that on the Xbox, you can pay for DLC, for these costumes and skins. So I had actually, in my piece, spoken with a, a man who used to work for PopCap's Shanghai division and had a lot of expertise and, and wisdom to offer about what it is that's so weird about this sort of Chinese deal. He is suggesting that a really localized version of Minecraft could be coming. Now, Minecraft, he said, might do very well because it sort of espouses these sorts of values in Chinese uh, regulators really like to make sure that their games instill lots of good values. They've actually blocked the ability to steal in certain games. So you can't in a uh, social mobile game just steal stuff from a neighbor. That's blocked, as is a mafia crime sort of thing. You ha the Values have to be espoused in this very specific China-friendly way. And there could very well be a weird sharing communism Minecraft to come. We really have no idea what that could be. It may very well just be sort of a skinning of local characters or local concepts. Uh, the man I spoke to who had been at PopCap said that the Great Wall edition of Plants vs. Zombies that PopCap put out in China was the one that put them sort of over the top and got local Chinese players to give a crap about Plants vs. Zombies. So this announcement is very skin on details. But it should be interesting to see how Microsoft, Mojang, and China all sort of come in uh, to cahoots together to uh, help that many more millions of people build little block towns with their friends. I feel like part of Minecraft does sort of feel communist too. I mean, everybody's working together, and uh, but there are there yeah there are things you like you can blow up cows apparently that might not be acceptable i can't even begin to think of how many jokes we could have about what the creepers might actually mean in terms of china's propaganda and things like that so i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it keep it just keep my mouth shut on okay. this line of humor but they, it, there's yeah there's certainly the community aspect of it and socialist jokes right here and there let's go crazy some other segment that's not for me right now. okay I mean, traditionally the chinese government has had a very sort of tough line when it came to video games. They're not keen on consoles. They try and keep keep a keep a lid on this. What is it about this that, that, that about Minecraft that has taken so long? Is it just that attitude or is it just that, you know, there wasn't really the demand? I think uh, Microsoft coming in uh, two years ago, I think two years is a reasonable amount of time for a giant company to stop and go, what's the best way to do it? There may have been a bidding war behind the scenes in which Microsoft said, hey, which of you wants to take a cut of this guaranteed cash? Uh, I think that seems to me more likely than any sort of regulation worry. And I just think on top of having to just fill out a bazillion forms just to get it going. So two years seems like a reasonable amount of time for this to happen. And I don't think that Mojang was necessarily interested in putting forth legwork. I don't think, I would imagine that Notch, uh, the Marcus person, that was his nickname. He was the original creator of Minecraft and he left the company right when the Microsoft money came in. I don't think he had any interest in building an app or dealing with the business of having to release software any way other than here you go. He was very, very proud of his the software just being sold uh, and or not even sold just being very easy to grab and easy to enjoy so i i imagine this is a lot more of microsoft saying okay well we just spent 2.5 billion let's go ahead and hit the chinese market and do what it takes to to be accessible there so the mobile version is available and the pc version but but not the xbox version or yes? the xbox xbox one uh is out and and as has been said it's uh, kind of locked down console distribution and sales are weird in China, but Microsoft's Xbox One is out there in limited numbers. So you can play Minecraft on an Xbox One already in China. And in fact, Microsoft reached out to me to let me know that. But that's not saying much. Uh, this is going to be a much bigger impact. A lot more people have smartphones and have access to internet cafes. Uh, that, that tends to be where you're going to see games like League of Legends, which is very huge in China, be played. So I think it's it's really getting on computers that's going to make a big splash and get a lot more Chinese people playing and assumedly spending money on the world of Minecraft. Well, uh, you can read Sam's whole piece on this. It's it's fascinating. I mean, Minecraft is the most popular video game in the world at this point, right? I, it's it's right up there and you know right next to League of Legends and a lot of these others it's huge so yeah this is this is going only going to make it bigger I can't imagine it launching in China and tanking yeah I mean and it's the a lot of the players are young so it's not like some video games that might be aging out they're just coming in 
Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, this week Nintendo made an announcement about a new sort of business plan that could include restaurants, medical and health devices, and computer software. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, this is uh, there. Are, this is one of these legalese, boring sort of filings about uh, changing uh, articles of incorporation. Uh, essentially, my uh, sorry, Nintendo. Uh, announced when they had their fiscal year projection for the next 12 months that they were switching to a more board of directors style of lead executive leadership, which may very well get more Western voices into making decisions for Nintendo, which people have been clamoring for for decades at this point. Um, I could say a very inappropriate uh, analogy about uh, what America is allowed to do with Japanese permission. It's an old funny joke. Anyway, point being, uh, <laughs> what was tucked into this statement was this set of underlying changes and three of them stood out to me, uh, one being that Nintendo is now officially saying they could make money opening a restaurant. Uh, the fact that they went to the trouble of writing that makes me think that that will definitely happen in one way, shape, or another. I don't know why they would put that in as a red herring. So a Nintendo restaurant, to me, just as a fanboy, sounds hilarious. I've already you know, guessed a lot of different terrible uh, food items, you know, a, a Moo Moo Ranch hamburger, a, uh, a sausage link, you know, it, it's the pun, the pun possibilities really could just ruin the show. And I'm going to stop right there. But uh, <laughs> in, in addition, there was also the mentioning, like you said, of medical devices, medical and health devices. And this may hint to Nintendo ramping effort, efforts, ramping efforts back up to get those uh, vitality sensors and sleep sensors that they've sort of hinted at and talked about and let languish at different conferences. This idea that they would have something hooked into either a smartphone or a game system that would watch your sleep and gamify uh, having better health practices in your sleep and also having a little uh, heart rate sensor. The idea was the Wii was going to have, when the Wii Fit came out, they thought, okay, we're gonna add a heart rate sensor which could either go with your fitness or go perhaps with the game and have biometric feedback play into how you play the game. That never took off. I'm not sure that that one could come back, but I do think the sleep one could very well happen or something else. Um, but what I was most interested in was them saying the phrase computer software. Uh, that was put in and it seemed unnecessary because everything else that they list pretty much signifies the idea of computer-powered imagery. Um, very broad terms that make it clear they're going to sell things like video games. And I don't know that computer software necessarily is that much different or requires that sort of declaration. Now that combined with the fact that they changed the phrasing about how they license uh, their material. They changed it from licensing um, copyrights and trademarks to licensing intellectual property. That's a much broader term, which could, and this is reading into things heavily, I, I would say, but that could really go into things like patents and trade secrets. Uh, why Nintendo would go to the trouble of putting all that language in there, uh, the, my, the answer that I'm really interested in and hoping it might come true is that we're going to have something really crazy coming out of this new system they've been talking about. Now, Nintendo executives have said the Nintendo NX which is its code name still, they still haven't announced the real name, is not going to be a successor to the Wii or the 3DS. I'm sorry, the Wii U or the 3DS. So not a home console and not a portable uh, Game Boy-ish thing. What the heck is it going to be? Uh, I'm starting to wonder if this is going to be some sort of computer lifestyle device. The 3DS has a couple of these little apps that track things in your life, as does the Wii U. But I... I think Nintendo might be setting the plate for something really weird and comprehensive that essentially says, okay, we're to be relevant. People really want smartphones. Maybe we can tap into that. And that would go right back to the, all these rumors from long ago that Android was going to be involved in this new Nintendo system. So if Nintendo decides to have part of its own proprietary stuff and part of its own latching onto other computer platforms that already exist, we could get something that people might actually want as opposed to this weird Wii U that was way too locked down, that was way too underpowered, that just did not take off. So uh, it could all mean nothing. At the very least, there's going to be some weird restaurant coming around the corner, and that's fine by me. But I would love to see some of these forward-reaching statements really pay off in the form of innovative, Wii-like stuff. You know, like when the Wii came out, it really blew people away. It did something different. And Nintendo may very well have something up its pocket, or it could just be releasing a very boring document and on a slow news day, I just talk and talk and hope and dream that it's something more interesting. So we'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, imagine something that we really want. That, that would be great. Uh, so finally, if you want a new gamer tag, they're recycling them at Microsoft. One million dormant Xbox Live 
date gamer tags could be yours. One could be yours. Uh, I actually snagged tag mix tag face um, because <laughs> why not? Uh, I wanted gamer tag mix gamer tag face, but that's too many uh, characters. Too many but characters. You got to limit it to fifteen. Mm -hmm. Tag mix tag uh, face. It's all mine. Some interesting recommendations right there. Droopily coast, <laughs> tasty or pepper. I don't even know what they're smoking over there, but they are in Washington <laughs> State, so could be something good. Uh, that's true. So about a million gamer tags were loosed, uh, and it was sort of interesting what Microsoft said they were doing. These were nicknames that were picked by people from the original Xbox, meaning they had the very first. Now, when we say Xbox One, we mean 1.0, not the stupid currently named Xbox One. Uh, those OG Xbox owners were able to get on Xbox Live for free and just type in a name. And it seems like what happened were people who simply tested out an Xbox, put in a name and never did anything with it or people who, for whatever reason, lost their login credentials and never transferred those names to a new system, those accounts were never used once the original Xbox online service shut down, I want to say in 2010. Um, so that meant six years of just sitting unclaimed, untouched, not reactivated. That was when Microsoft said, okay, uh, they're, they're, they're free, they're ready, let's, let's go ahead and get them. And they had this list of what the names might be, including the greatest invention. So I think sliced bread. I think that was their hint that saying that the word, the phrase sliced bread was one. I, I guess that grilled cheese might be one that could be claimed. It was it was hard to see. I haven't actually gone back to look to see which ones were freed up and not. But it was proper nouns, names of uh, people, locations. Um, you know, maybe someone got Christopher Walken finally. Uh, it's it. it it, it, but it is interesting because it's so rare that you get an online service that says we're doing a giant dump of usernames. It's so common when we talk about a new service, like maybe I'll write a brief about some new uh, Twitter-like thing like Ello, for example, or what was the other one we were talking about like two Peach. months ago? That Oh, yeah. Peach. How many times have you logged into that, right? <laughs> but you race to it because you want to get that username just in case that service turns out to not be garbage. So what happens here is this is one of those really rare occasions where there's a line in the sand and someone says, we have a bunch of usernames. It's just a very rare digital occurrence. We'll be looking back on this in 40 years and going, God, I remember the great username gold rush of 2016 <laughs> when, when Microsoft unearthed the special hidden vault. And they may do it again. Uh, you know, with any of these specific gaming services that are tied to old hardware, because we, we are about to leave this era of you need X system to access Y online service. Even Microsoft is saying that they want Xbox to just be this thing that whatever you own, it's just you're, you'll be able to access your old Xbox stuff. So this sort of uh, taking of old username uh, bundles and loosing them, it, it's not long for this world. So remember this day, share it with your grandkids. Cherish, cherish your ability to get tastier nugget 47 or whatever <laughs> name you want i don't know i was thinking tea drinker but yes you know mm -hmm. that's good <laughs> whatever works well as long as you don't have to add an obnoxious uh, combination of letters and numbers and x's and 420s and all those good <laughs> signifiers oh man usernames just crack me up <laughs> you'd be amazed at some of the emails we get from people with really really dodgy email names you know people applying for jobs with well, I can't really repeat them on air, but for goodness sake, people, just get yourself a professional email account. <laughs> I mean, really, the dream, the dream is just that you uh, catch that hot slang the instant it hits and get that username before any service realizes, oh, God, we just got a whole new ethnic slur problem here. You're like, nope, too late. I didn't violate your terms of service. Thank you. <laughs> I also remember the day when, like, you would advise children to have, like, don't have, like, a provocative gaming name because that was the most information that you were that children were giving out and now it's just like who cares about the gamer name it's like kids are giving out pictures and everything so yeah the kids these days with their snapchats the kids these days with their <laughs> snapchat well sam thank you so much for joining us sam's work of course is at ars technica he can be found on twitter at sam red thanks so much for coming on thank Good you guys all right i have to figure out how wh where's i think someone tell me where's the power button how do i, <laughs> I, I, I don't eat it figure it out I, <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, Dana Schwartz wrote in with a question for you, Ian. He wrote, we've heard that courts can't ask you for your passcodes to unlock your devices because of Fifth Amendment protections against self-incrimination. But recently, we've also heard reports about use of the All Writs Act to, to require defendants to unlock their devices themselves without disclosing the passcodes to the court. So is there a difference here? Aren't people still being asked to self-incriminate or does this process effectively circumvent the Fifth Amendment? 
you still have to use something you know to unlock, but just not disclose it. Well, I've been chatting to the EFF about this today, and I'm afraid to say that it does appear to be legal. Um, they back, actually filed an amicus brief in the filed an amicus brief in the case which which triggered all this, uh, and they're arguing quite you know from their perspective that this is obviously an abuse of the All Writs Act. Um, but it has been used by the U.S. Uh, before, and I'm just trying to pronounce the name, but it's U.S. Frixu uh, versus Frixu. That they have forced people to unlock their phones in this way. And there's an ongoing case in, I think it's Pittsburgh, where a bloke has been spent seven months in prison because he's refusing to decrypt hard drives, which uh, the authorities suspect may ha may harbour child abuse images. Now, it's a bit of a sneaky workaround, but it is being used by law enforcement to try and get people to unlock their phones. We're still at the, at the sort of the very early days of this, though. So there is a, case, a body of case law building up which would... Uh, which would which would agree that this isn't a breach, a breach of the Fifth Amendment, but no one's taken it to the Supremes yet, and uh, that could be very interesting if it does happen. All right. Well, after the break, we will talk to a photographer, who, a photographer who serendipitously managed to capture the second stage burn and first stage entry of the Falcon 9 landing, in spite of some pesky turtles. But first, let's take a minute to thank Igloo Software, the sponsor of this episode. Igloo is an internet you'll actually like. It's a cloud platform that helps you share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects. Anyone can add content based on their permissions with drag and drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor. Igloo also offers a variety of access, authentication, and identity services to ensure that only authorized users have access in private clouds over SSL and 256-bit encryption. Unlike other solutions, you can customize Igloo to fit your needs and work with your current IT investments like Office 365 or Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, and file sharing solutions like Google Drive and Dropbox. It's used by large enterprises and growing companies like User Testing, BDO, American Family Insurance, and ATP World Tour. You can try it free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. And when you sign up through our link, you can get your own Igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. That's igloosoftware.com slash T-W-I-T, and we thank them for their support. So a bit earlier this week, I got a tweet from a viewer with a suggestion that I take a look at the personal blog of a photographer who had captured some amazing images of the SpaceX Falcon 9 landing. Thankfully, thankfully for us, that photographer, Zach Grither, is here to tell us how he created the work, these works of art, on his website. Welcome, Zach. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for coming on. So you took, sure. these, you took these photos on the evening of May 6th. Uh, tell us what was so important about this particular landing. Uh, it was the first uh, successful night landing on uh, their um, platform out at sea. So it was, uh, it's one of those really cool once-in-a-lifetime events that we don't really ever get to see. And so you were, what were you doing out there? I was uh, just out shooting. Um, I had no idea. I, I, where I was at was Hunting Island State Park and it's really difficult to get a uh, campground or campsite at the campground there and because it's one of the darker places in the southeast and uh, I was stuck into doing a Thursday Friday night kind of thing and I wasn't really happy about it but I, I decided to do it anyways so I just went there Thursday night um, took a three-hour nap and got up about midnight and went out and start, started shooting and uh, I was finishing up on this one composition on a tree and I saw out in the corner of my eye um, something go up and uh, it ended up being something pretty cool. So tell, uh, tell us a little bit about the gear that you were using. Uh, I have a Sony A7 uh, R2, and uh, it's uh, a Zeiss Otis 28mm f1.4 lens. So it's uh, probably the best, the best gear I could come up with to uh, shoot uh, night sky at this point. And so, so you got some amazing shots. They were really, but, really very beautiful. Uh, thank you. And yes, first, first night landing, but also the first landing on three engines. So at least you'd didn't get quite the full burn that the, the full engines would have gone, but it's uh, sure. it just uh, it, it worked beautifully. You must have been thrilled. I was. I, I mean, I, there's a, so much excitement. I think didn't even know what was going on. Um, I just knew that as I saw it kind of floating through the sky, which you can't really see the contrail at, at night. You just kind of see a dot kind of floating along, along the sky. So when I started shooting again, um, I just kind of sat there and watched. I didn't really know what to think. And uh, as it went off, I, I just kind of excitedly just grabbed my, my tripod and walked away thinking, oh, it was awesome. Um, but uh, 
normally in that situation, I would have done a little bit more on, on my composition. I would have done some, gotten some more detail and some things. So in the end, you know, the end product wasn't the greatest for me, but the overall shot still is, you know, one in a million. So can't complain. Uh, you also ran into uh, a, a turtle problem. Can you tell us about your turtle problem? Yeah, it's a uh, sea turtle season uh, in the southeast, and um, it's one of those things where from May to October, South Carolina has a, a new mandate where you're not allowed to have lights on the beach. And for a while, they were, you know, you're allowed to have red lights, things that were not very sensitive. But at this time, uh, this year, they've made it no lights. So you're kind of limited to how you can you know, operate your camera in the middle of the dark, but you kind of just do what you can um, and then just go from there. A lot of test shots and a lot of, a lot of gaffer tape to, to um, cover over any lights. But, you know, you kind of you do what you can do. And, and how did you process the photos? Uh, I, I have a basic uh, technique where I, I usually take about 30 images, and then uh, that way, I have a, at, at a minimum, I have a lot of images to shoot from or choose from, and then some. A lot of them I end up stacking together and removing some noise through Photoshop through a, a stacking process that I've I've come across. And uh, once I have the basic, you know, the basic adjustments done, uh, at least at this point. Um, what you're looking at now is the actual, um, all of them put together uh, with a, a light and blend mode. So the lightest parts of each, Im Im each image comes through and shows on one image. And from there, uh, I ended up masking out the, the actual rocket trail and cleaning it up and then um, putting it back on top of one of the original images of the Milky Way. They're really amazing. So this isn't the first time you've caught something unexpected uh, when you've been out shooting. No, uh, when I was living in Arizona a couple years ago, I, uh, I went up to a very prominent peak called Weaver's Needle, and uh, it, was, it was a full moon. I wanted to just try shooting star trails that night, and I got up there, and I got everything set up, and I just started shooting. I just I had set up, set up to go for maybe an hour, and uh, I just kind of sat back, and I, I think I had like a slice of cold pizza and maybe a beer or something, and I just kind of sitting there relaxing, and I pulled out my phone, and I have this... ISS tracker app that I, I sometimes look at, and it had a, a notice saying that the International Space Station was going to be showing up, you know, in like five minutes. And I quickly looked and see where it was, where it was going to be, and I was like, I think it's going to be right there. So uh, I didn't have to do anything. I just kind of, I guessed, and I just left the camera running. And uh, next thing I know, when I got home, I had like 450 images that I had to stack together, and spent I don't know three weeks trying to work through it, but. At the end of the day, by the end of that, I had you know a really cool ISS uh, traversing through a, the actual landscape nightscape shot that I wanted. So that yeah, was pretty cool. That's amazing. Uh, so are your photos for sale? They are. Yes, they are available through my website. So that's slowcountrylife.com, uh, and Zach is also on Instagram at slowcountrylife. Got some amazing sky photos, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your story and telling us. Uh, all about uh, how you caught these awesome pictures. I hope you're in the right place at the right time. Next time there's something amazing in the sky. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Take care, Zach. Thank you. Thanks. You too. So, Ian, thank you for joining us also. I know you're going to be hosting the screensavers tomorrow. Um, it's always Video, fun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Always fun. Uh, and I'm sure you guys will have a lot to talk about with uh, Google I.O., um, oh, you'll have yes. a lot more time to rant about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been positively restrained. If you trust me, on on you know sort of Wednesday morning, if if you would have caught me at the bad at a bad moment, there would have been an awful lot of effing and blinding going on. It was not a good start to the session. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like you wore sunscreen at least. You're not too burned. Uh, I did. I mean, this is actually very tan for me because with my Scots heritage, my skin tone is actually pale blue, and it takes me about a week in the sun to get white. Um, so no, I slathered on the sunscreen. I had a, my big bush hat, which I use for sailing, and that covers an awful lot of stuff as well. The long sleeve, long sleeve shirt and, and collar was up the whole time. But you know, it's just I don't understand how Californians put, put up with this. This sunshine can be brutal at times. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to watching you on the screensavers tomorrow. Is there anything else that uh, you've been working on that we should know about? Uh, well, you know, so we're keeping an eye on things that the current uh, sort of. Topic du jour for us is the SWIFT financial tracking, uh, financial um, uh, payments uh, system that's uh, been having a few worries and is now beefing up its security. So we'll see how that turns out. Hopefully they're not going to lose many more millions. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you so much, Ian. Ian is at the register and at Ian Thompson on Twitter. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure as always, Megan. Have a great weekend. <laughs> you too. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC. You can find us at twit.tv slash live. You can also be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leave us a short voicemail. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. You can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. And if you want to be the first to get our show and you can't watch it live, subscribe. You can find all the ways to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. And we're on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play and all the places. You can get our newsletter at twit.tv slash newsletter. And I am on Twitter at Megan Maroney. And thank you to Anthony. He's our technical director. And thank you to all the people who help us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for sticking around till the end. We will see you on Monday. Thank you.